So, in the scripture lesson today from the Gospel of Mark, Jesus gets two requests. One of those requests he grants, one of those requests he denies. Uh, before we get into that, though, let's back up a little bit uh, and see if uh, y'all can remember something that we talked about for the last two weeks. Don't worry, I'm not going to actually ask you if you know what we talked about. I'm just going to remind you of some things that we've talked about. So later you can pretend like you were listening. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So if you recall, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how in the Gospel of Mark, there are, uh, per- there's a particular phrase that the Gospel writer uses to tell us that we need to pay attention that it's sort of a marker for the Gospel of Mark that lets us know that something significant or something important is about to happen. And it's when the Gospel writer talks about how Jesus and the disciples were on the way. Does this ring a bell? And last week, we talked about how in the Scripture, it didn't really say in the translation that we had that they were on the way, but it said they were on a journey. They were setting out on a journey, and we talked about how the Greek word for journey was the same for the Greek word for way. Well, this week, uh, they are on the road to Jerusalem, and guess what? The Greek word for road Same as the way. So Jesus and the disciples are on the way to Jerusalem. Not only is it significant because they're on the way, but think about where they are going. They are going to Jerusalem and all that that entails. Because we know where they are going. And we know what will happen when they get there. So the disciples are on the way, and because they're on the way, Jesus takes the opportunity to do a little teaching, all right? He teaches them about what it means to be the Messiah from his point of view. Now, again, if you recall, we were talking about how the way Jesus understood being the Messiah was the complete antithesis of how everyone else believed the Messiah was going to be. Jesus takes this opportunity to teach the disciples about how the Messiah is to be one who suffers, one who is a servant leader. And remember, that's the exact opposite of everything the disciples and all the Jews in that time thought about the Messiah. The Messiah was supposed to be the Savior who came as a king to cast out the oppressors, to cast out the Romans, and bring a whole new way of life to the people. Never was the Messiah supposed to suffer. Was the Messiah supposed to be a servant leader? But, evidently, the disciples still don't get this. Because James and John come to Jesus with a request. And Jesus says to them, what will you have me do for you? And their request has to do with their understanding of the Messiah as the king, the ruler, the one they are expecting. They ask Jesus, uh, Lord, when you come into your glory, grant it to us, James and John, sons of Zebedee, to sit on your right and on your left. And so Jesus, it seems pretty clear, realizes they still don't know what he is talking about. When I was a kid, when I heard that, Uh, this phrase about James and John asking to sit on Jesus' right and left, I had a vision of them asking about, you know, when we all get to heaven, right? When we all get to heaven, Jesus is going to have this beautiful cloud throne, and James and John wanted to sit next to him. That's what I thought when I was a kid. I'm not sure that's really the case anymore. James and John, I don't think, are talking about what's going to happen in heaven. I think they're talking about what they think is about to happen. Remember, they are expecting a Messiah to be a ruler like all the other rulers they know. They are expecting a Messiah to be that same kind of ruler that elevates those who have been there with him all along and puts them in places of status, places of authority, places of power like on their right and on their left. So Jesus asked them, Can you drink the cup that I drink? Can you share in the baptism that I share? 
And it seems really clear that James and John obviously have not been paying attention. Because they just immediately say, yes, sir, we can do it. Think about this for a minute. Baptism and cup that Jesus is talking about. These are like the bookends of Jesus' ministry. When Jesus began in his ministry and he came to John in the River Jordan, the Holy Spirit descended on a dove. Anybody remember what happened that day? Ugh. I now know how Jesus feels when he talked to the disciples and they didn't listen. No, that's right. So I had it. Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan that day. Jesus was baptized. That was the beginning of his ministry. Then the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And then that same Holy Spirit, right after that baptism, if you remember, drove him into the wilderness where he was to be tempted and where he was confronted by Satan. That's his baptism. And the cup that he's speaking of in a few weeks We're going to go with Jesus to the garden in Gethsemane. And there, on the night before, on the night he is betrayed by one of his disciples, by Judas, the night that he's handed over to be arrested, to be tortured, and eventually crucified, that night he prays to God, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. The cup at the end. That is the baptism and the cup that Jesus is talking about. And it is nothing to be taken lightly because it is a serious implication with serious consequences. And so when they say, yes, we can share in that, you can almost hear Jesus sigh and say, you just don't understand. But he does say, yes, you will share in my baptism and in my cup. But it is not for me to grant who will be on my right and on my left in glory. Well, we know the story. And we know that when Jesus comes into his glory on the cross, we know who's on his right and his left. Two nameless nameless thieves, one on his right and one on his left. So Jesus turns down James and John's request to be on his right and on his left. And then, after some squabbling with the other disciples, he goes on and he runs into Bartimaeus as they are leaving Jericho on the way to Jerusalem. Bartimaeus says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Let me see again. And Jesus grants his request. And suddenly, Bartimaeus can see. So in this text today, there are two requests made of Jesus, and one of them is denied, and one of them is granted. Back up for a minute. Does anybody remember uh, that Garth Brooks song, uh, Sometimes I Thank God for Unanswered Prayers? Anybody remember that? It was popular when I was in high school or middle school, something like that. It was a big hit uh, for Garth Brooks. Uh, The story is uh, that he goes to a high school football game with his wife and kids, and there he sees his old high school girlfriend. And when he sees his old high school girlfriend, he is reminded of how much in high school he prayed and prayed and prayed that God would make that girlfriend his wife for the rest of his life. And he sees now with the wife that he has and the wife that he didn't have, how grateful he is for the wife that he has and how grateful he is that God did not answer that prayer. Okay, as great as the song was, and as popular as it was, it really bothered my mom. She was terribly irked by this song, and she would say every time she heard it on the radio, she took it as a moment to teach us a little something, and said, it's not that God didn't answer his prayer, it's just that God said no to his prayer. She said, God answers every prayer, it's just that sometimes God says no. And of course, sometimes when God says no, we just don't want to hear that divine no. And so we assume that God is not answering our prayer. It's a lot easier to assume that God is not answering our prayer because then we might just keep asking it than to assume that God just said no. But God answers every prayer. And sometimes God says no. In the movie Bruce Almighty... Uh, Bruce is played by Jim Carrey, and for a a period of time, he gets the gift of being God for a little while. 
One of the things that he doesn't understand in the beginning when he gets this gift is that it is a huge responsibility. One of those responsibilities is to listen to and respond to prayers. And it becomes overwhelming to him. So he tries to find all these different ways to organize the prayers. First, he gets the prayers into file cabinets. Then he gets the prayers on post-it notes. Then finally, he puts the prayers into an email system. And as he types away, trying to respond to every single prayer, he gets exhausted and realizes there's no way that he can ever make a dent in all of these prayer requests. So he just hits, reply all, yes. He says, there. Now everybody will get what they want, and everyone will be happy. And of course they were, until everyone really got what they wanted, and chaos ensued around him. When we pray, oftentimes we ask for things. And if we don't really get what we want, we may assume that God's not listening. But the reality is that maybe God just said no to what we asked. I mean, we know that uh, when we pray, it's, it's more than just about asking for what we want, right? We know, it's like what we talked about here with the young ones, that prayer is really about building a relationship with God. But the reality is that many times our prayers take on the character of petition. We ask God for things. But surely we understand that we're not the only ones praying to God, Surely we understand that not every time everything that we want is what God thinks is best for everyone. Surely we understand that. And so if we understand that, then we understand it's okay that sometimes God says no. Because maybe what we want is not what's best or in line with what God wants. Sometimes God says no to these requests. So here in the passage, again, we have these two requests, and Jesus says no to one and yes to another. So the question is, why? Why does Jesus say yes to one request and no to another request? Well, the typical answer to this is why Jesus says no to one thing or why God says no to one thing and yes to another is faith. And that's actually what is said in Scripture, right? In this story, Jesus says to blind Bartimaeus, who suddenly gets to see, Jesus says to Bartimaeus, your faith has made you well. And then he can see. James and John just heard, I can't do that for you. So, if we have faith, our prayers are answered, right? We've heard that, right? We've probably heard it from people we know. We've probably heard it from lots of televangelists. If you just have enough faith, God will answer your prayers. If you just have enough faith, God will heal you. But I don't think that's the case. I mean, we've already seen in the Gospel of Mark that A person's healing by Jesus is not dependent upon their faith. Think back to the story, one of the earliest stories of Jesus' ministry, of when he's in Capernaum and the paralytic is brought to see him. If you remember that story about the paralytic, you know, there were so many people in the house. The paralytic was brought on a mat by his friends, and they couldn't get into the house to see Jesus. And so his friends had to dig a hole in the roof and lower the man down to be in front of Jesus. And the man is forgiven of his sins, and he is healed, but not because of his faith. Jesus says because of their faith, because of the faith of his friends, the man is healed and forgiven. And you might say, okay, well, it still has to do with faith. It's all about faith as to whether or not uh, God says yes to your petitions, yes to your prayers, yes to your healing. But that can't be the case. Because if it's about faith, does that mean that James and John, the Zebedee boys, had no faith? I mean, surely they had as much faith as anybody. I mean, they had put in the time with Jesus. They had seen everything that Jesus could do. They had been with him. They had cast out demons. They had healed the sick. Surely they had faith. But yet still, their request was denied. 
So it can't be about faith. I mean, we like to think that uh, if someone isn't healed when they ask God uh, for healing, it's because they don't have enough faith. Or if someone is healed, it's because they do have enough faith. But it seems awfully clear that faith is not the prerequisite for God saying yes to our prayers or yes to our requests. So again, why? Why does Jesus say no to one request and yes to another? Why does God say no to some requests and yes to another? And the answer is, we don't know. We really don't have a clue. We like to think we do. We like to make up formulas for how God works, right? We like to say that if we do X, then God will do Y, right? We've all heard people say that, you know, if you give more money, then you'll become more wealthy, right? Plant your seed money and see your wealth expand. If you are better stewards, God will be a better steward of you. If you have more faith, your prayers will be answered. We like to believe that we can do certain things to make God do certain things. Do y'all remember about 15 years ago, uh, the book came out, uh, The Prayer of Jabez? Does anybody remember that? It's a prayer by a man named Jabez who was in the Old Testament. And we took this book and this prayer and we turned it into something more than it was ever intended to be. Uh, We were told that, you know, if you read this book, if you say this prayer and follow this 30-day protocol, then God will increase your territory. Maybe, but maybe not. There are no guarantees that if we do one thing, we can make God do another. Sometimes people do these things and God does that other thing. Sometimes people do these things and God does not do that other thing. There is no direct correlation between what we do and what we can make God do in response. So we don't really know why God says yes to some and no to others. Does that mean that we shouldn't be faithful? Does it mean that we shouldn't give? Does it mean that we shouldn't pray? Absolutely not. All of those things we do because we want to have a deeper and better relationship with God. It has nothing to do with what we can get from God. It's about what we do for God. Now again, we don't know why Jesus does this, but what we can say is that we can look and we can see a difference between what happens in the two requests that Jesus has made of Jesus. When James and John make their request, and when blind Bartimaeus makes his request, Jesus responds to them, "Uh, what will you have me do for you? And then it changes. James and John ask for status. They ask for power. They ask for authority, for recognition. Bartimaeus asks for mercy. Jesus, son of David, Have mercy on me. And we should know by now, if we know nothing else about Jesus' ministry, is that Jesus prefers to dole out mercy over status and authority any day of the week. Jesus' ministry is about uh, lifting up those who need it to be on a level playing field with everyone else. It's not about placing others in positions of power over everyone else. So we don't really know why Jesus says yes or why Jesus says no. But we do know that he does say yes to Bartimaeus when he asks for mercy. Amen.